Hello, and welcome back to Senate Judiciary. I will call the meeting to order. Will the secretary please take the roll? Senator Harris. Here. Senator Dondero Loop. Senator Orenshaw. Here. Senator Wynn. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Senator Stone. Here. Chair Scheibel. Here. Thank you. Um, please mark any senators present, present, who are not present, present when they arrive. I think you know what I mean. Uh, the same thing we do every day. Uh, today we have two bill hearings on our schedule as well as a BDR introduction. I'm going to start with the BDR introduction. Um, the BDR that we have in front of us today is 1-795. Um, and I have a copy of it if any of the members want to read a copy of it. What it does is it um, ameliorates some unintended consequences of a bill that we passed last year that was providing um, regarding the temporary protective orders hearings f when a juvenile is the adverse party in that hearing. And so this would ensure that um, the statements, et cetera, that are made at the TPO hearing are not used against the juvenile in a criminal proceeding. So I would entertain a motion to introduce BDR. And remember, this is only a motion to introduce the BDR. This is not um, your support or opposition to the bill itself. So I would entertain a motion to introduce all right, I have a motion from Senator Stone to introduce BDR 1-795. And I have a second from uh, Senator Orenshaw. All those in favor say aye. And any opposed, nay. Um, it unanimously passes to introduce BDR 1-795. And with that, um, I will turn the gavel over to our incredible Vice Chair Harris as I am presenting both of the bills on our agenda today. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. Uh, welcome everybody to Chair Scheibel Day in Judiciary. Uh, and Chair, if it's okay with you, I believe you wanna start with 234, numerical order. Okay, we'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 234. Uh, Chair Scheibel, go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. For the record, I'm Melanie Scheibel, representing Senate District 9 in Las Vegas. It's my pleasure to come before you today and present Senate Bill 234. I'm joined by a Nevada youth legislator, Max Greenstein, um, and he will really be doing the bulk of the presentation because this bill is his idea. Um, what Senate Bill 234 does is facilitate communication between people who are incarcerated in the Department of Corrections and their children. Uh, the bill has a conceptual amendment to it, which um, is on Nellis, and if any of you need a copy of it, we could certainly make sure that you get a paper copy of it. Um, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Youth Legislator Greenstein, who represents Senate District 15 in Washoe County. Um, he's done a lot of excellent work on this bill and has a great deal of information to share with the committee. Before I turn it over to him to do the presentation, I do just want to give a brief summary of the bill as it's written. Uh, Mr. Greenstein will speak more to the amendment. But as written, Senate Bill 234 is fairly simple. Um, and I know making that claim can be dangerous, but in this case, it's, it's true. Uh, Section 1 just says that we're going to create a program um, and this conceptual amendment talks to the funding of that program that allows for calls from the people who are in custody at the Department of Corrections to their children to be free of charge. Um, the director of the Nevada Department of Corrections would be allowed to apply for and accept grants or gifts to carry out the program and adopt any necessary regulations to administer it. Um, it also makes clear, the bill makes clear that it does not authorize communications that would otherwise be prohibited by law, court order, or Nevada Department of Corrections policy. Um, it also requires the department to submit a report on any recommendations regarding the program to LCB by January 1st of 2025. Um, section 1 makes clear that when we're, when we're talking about children, we're talking about someone who is under the age of 18. And uh, communication services could include voice over internet protocol or a telephone call. Section 2 contains the effective dates of the bill and um, the, the time by which, which is June 30th, 2025, by which we hope to have a well-established program for providing better communication between people who are incarcerated and their children. And with that, I'll turn it over to Youth Legislator Greenstein to talk more about the bill's origins and the details. 
Thank you, Senator Scheibel, and thank you, committee, for the opportunity to be here today to present SB 234. My name is Max Greenstein, M-A-X-G-R-I-N-S-T-E-I-N, for the record. I'm a junior in high school at the Davidson Academy in Reno, and additionally, as Senator Scheibel mentioned, I serve as the Nevada Youth Legislator for Senate District 15. Now, to make a long story short, SB 234 provides for the creation of a pilot program to provide free phone calls between incarcerated parents and their children. Now, I'm not here presenting today as someone who is personally impacted by the problem that this legislation endeavors to solve, but instead I'm presenting as someone who has engaged extensively with incarcerated perspectives over the past two years. And one of those perspectives comes from Juan Turner. Juan is one of the 600 incarcerated people across 35 states, including Nevada, who has been published by the Prison Journalism Project. The Prison Journalism Project, where I've worked as an intern for the past two years, trains and publishes incarcerated journalists, all with the end goal of helping to illuminate the often murky world behind bars. And something that really speaks to me the most about my work at the Prison Journalism Project is the personal stories that people sell, share with us, the personal anecdotes and how people let us behind the curtain. And to that end, I want to share Juan's story with you today. In his August 2022 article, Juan shares the joy of his eight-year-old daughter's visits to prison, punctuated by five-minute-long bear hugs when the uh, bell to mark the five-minute-long um, uh, rings. His story shows us that the bond of parenthood transcends even prison walls, um, but I should say for the committee that it's not all good. For one, he lets us know in a loving way that his daughter's incessant request during these visits to have more allowance money to buy dolls can get old, as I'm sure the members of the committee who are parents can attest to. But then also more fundamentally and more importantly, he lets us know that the brief 90 minute visits that he has with his daughter and the infrequent and expensive 15 minute phone calls they have together aren't um, sufficient to foster the kind of relationship that he wants with his daughter, and certainly not the kind of relationship that his daughter deserves to have with him. And I'll just share a brief quote from Juan's article. He writes that these brief moments of communication are highlights of our lives. In a sense, it confirms the theory that pleasure never lasts long. We get so caught up in each other that we sometimes forget we're on the clock, if only we had more time. Now, if you're interested, I've shared Juan's story and a number of other stories from the Prison Journalism Project that deal with incarcerated parents to the committee for review. But my point in bringing in Juan and his daughter isn't to focus specifically on them as individuals, but instead to use them as an entry point to kind of the central thesis that underlies SB 234, both as an idea and as a piece of legislation before the Judiciary Committee. And that's this that calls between incarcerated parents and their children are vitally important for both parent and for child, but that in our current system, there are important structural barriers related to cost that are standing in the way of that full benefit. Pursuant to NRS 209.42305, incarcerated offenders in the state of Nevada currently have the right to maintain contact with their children unless they're otherwise prohibited from doing so from A, a court order, B, departmental policy, or C, the consent of the child or of the child's guardian on the outside world. And generally speaking, that is to say that our state's law recognizes the importance of incarcerated parent-child relationships and seeks to encourage them. But unfortunately, once we get into the practical, real world, it's not always so easy and so straightforward. In the current system, Nevada families are paying exorbitant rates to our contracted phone operator, working out to around 14 cents per minute for a collect call and around 11 cents per minute for a prepaid call. And kind of taking a step back, over the course of a year of 30 minute weekly calls, these costs can total well over hundreds of dollars. And that's not even considering families who have multiple children or the fact that per the very nature of incarceration, many of these families only have one breadwinner. And in fact, what I think is especially pernicious in this regard is that a portion of those high rates is then being returned back to the state as a kickback, which essentially means that the state of Nevada is currently taxing children's abilities to speak to their parents behind bars. And there are real world consequences to these barriers being placed between parents and children, with academic research proving that phone calls have significant benefits for children, for parents, and then for the society at large and for the prison system at large. 
there are clear benefits to children, with one 2014 meta-analysis by Pullman et al. finding that frequent calls were correlated with increased um, educational attainment and grades for children, um, as well as a decreased behavioral problems. And then kind of from the perspective of um, the prison system and from the perspective of the offender, um, there was a 2020 study by Haverkate and Wright, and I'll emphasize for the committee that there's been a lot of research on this subject, um, which noted that frequent contact with family members while incarcerated serves to reduce recidivism rates post-incarceration. In this sense, the research appears to be quite conclusive. By putting a little bit of effort into the issue of um, incarcerated parent-child relationships now, we can set the state up for future success in the future. And to that end, I'll note that Nevada would not be the first jurisdiction um, making progress in promoting incarcerated parent-child relationships. In 2019, the New York City Council voted to make all calls between um, people on the outside and offenders in its jails and detention facilities free. That resolution was followed um, in the past two years by similar laws in Connecticut and California. And actually, just this week, the Florida legislature voted to make appropriations for a pilot program to provide free calls to offenders in its state. As compared to these pieces of legislation, what SB 234 is trying to do is a targeted and focused solution to um, the problem that we've outlined by establishing a pilot program to provide free calls between incarcerated parents and their children. With your permission, Vice Chair Harris, I'd like to walk the committee briefly through the provisions of the bill, as well as how the conceptual amendment that we have submitted slightly alters those provisions. Absolutely. So as Senator Scheibel kind of alluded to in the introduction, this is a fairly concise and fairly straightforward piece of legislation. Starting from the first provisions, um, section 1, subsection 1, outlines the intent behind the pilot program, namely that it should be intended to foster long-term and sustainable connections between incarcerated parents and their children, children being people who are under 18 years of age. Um, and then subsection 2, perhaps the bill's most important aspect, how are we going to pay for it? In its current iteration, the bill only authorizes the department to apply for gifts, grants, donations, bequeathments, etc to cover the cost of the program. However, in conversations with various legislators, various committee members, and other stakeholders, we came to the conclusion that um, it wasn't sustainable in the long term to have the bill's only funding source be, um, be so uncertain. So what we're proposing in the conceptual amendment is to amend the bill to authorize the department to draw from the offender's store fund which is a special revenue fund established pursuant to NRS 209.221. I want to pause here and take a step back and emphasize that in either of these funding options, there would be no fiscal impact on Nevada taxpayers. To state the obvious, um, gifts, grants, donations, bequeathments, and other sources of money would not come from any tax revenue. And then, on the other hand, the offender store fund is a pre-existing special revenue fund that currently has a $14 million surplus that is raised from the department's sale of things like commissary and phone calls, but importantly not from any tax revenue. So in both ways, there would not be an impact on Nevada taxpayers in implementing this pilot program. The next subsection that I'll walk you through, subsection 5, um, instructs the director of the Department of Corrections to submit a report to the 83rd section of the, uh, of the legislature uh, about the successes of the pilot program, room for improvement, et cetera. What we're proposing in the conceptual amendment is to make some of those reporting requirements more clear. Um, and then finally, subsection 6 is mostly definitional in nature, um, but we propose amending that slightly uh, to account for the potential use of video visitation. As I'm sure some committee members are aware, AB 35 is currently pending before the assembly. And should that pass, there's the potential that offenders in Nevada could have access to tablets in their prison. And those tablets could potentially enable video calling. So we believe that video calling should still fall under the umbrella of intent that SB 234 is casting out. And we believe that those should still be provided free to the children of offenders. And kind of with that, with that level setting done, 
I want to step back and for the final few minutes of the presentation, I want to answer perhaps the most important question about any piece of legislation, which is kind of fundamentally, why should you support it? And I think the answer here is clear. The answer that underlies any other answer is that it's about families. Um, at the end of the day, this bill is about the family unit. It's about strengthening family bonds and showing that even if a family is separated uh, by prison walls, the strongest bond in the world is still between a parent and their child. Juan, who we introduced you to in the beginning, um, his daughter might not fully understand why her father's in prison, but she does understand how much he loves her. And that feeling of love stays with her, even though her father can't be with her 24 seven. So that is to say that only good things can come from fostering and promoting relationships between incarcerated parents and their children. I appreciate the committee's time and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have our first question from Senator Orenshaw. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Senator Scheibel and Youth Legislator Greenstein, thank you for presenting this important bill. You know, in the past, so often I've talked to children who have had a parent who's incarcerated, and so often I've felt from that child that they feel abandoned. They feel like you know, the parent, you know, made these choices and is not there. And I, I know you talked about studies that show less recidivism when there is better communication between someone incarcerated and their children. I just wonder, do you think that if something like this passes and in Nevada we have better communication between incarcerated persons and their children, that there'll be better outcomes for children, that they'll you know do better in school and perhaps less chance of getting in trouble with uh, the juvenile justice system? I sure appreciate the, the bill. Thank you. Max Greenstein, for the record, thank you for the question. Um, through Vice Chair Harris to Senator Orenshaw, um, I don't think that there's any one, um, I don't think that there's any one piece of legislation or any one pilot program that we can introduce that will completely um, kind of alleviate the burden um, and kind of the emotions that Nevada children feel when their parents are incarcerated. The very nature of incarceration is challenging on youth. Um, and simply instituting any one piece of legislation I don't think will fully solve that. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to make um, tr strides towards um, sort of alleviating that burden. And that's something that SB 234 endeavors to do. Thank you, Youth Legislator Greenstein. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. I appreciate the bill. Thank you, Vice Chair. We will go to Senator Stone and then Senator Hansen. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair and Max. Senator Stone, if you could pull your mic towards you. Thank you. Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, Max, I, first of all, let me say that I'm very impressed uh, with you. I'm very impressed with your presentation. Uh, in, in Yiddish, we call a young man like you a mensch. I think you might understand what that means, but I, I consider you a mensch. You're, you're a bright young man that I think is going to have a very um, successful future, and I hope that you pursue public service because I can tell that you have the passion for it. Um, and, I, and I agree with you. I think the bond between a parent and a child uh, is one of the most important bonds out there. And it's unfortunate that sometimes would-be criminals don't think about the consequences of their actions until after the actions have happened and they find themselves in prison and their children are suffering. Uh, and that bond needs to be maintained. So I fully support your wonderful idea and I appreciate that uh, Senator Scheibel gave you the opportunity to, to present this great idea. So just a couple of concerns that I, I might have that uh, may require some public funding is that a impediment to the parents talking to their children has been cost, right? So there's only a certain amount of infrastructure in, the, in our jails and prisons that allow for our convicts to have these worthy conversations and relationships. So how are we going to, I mean obviously the demand for talking to family is going to increase, and I hope it does. Um, how are we going to ensure that we have the appropriate infrastructure so that we don't turn people away, number one. And number two, um, how do you see that the level of prisoner will be prioritized, if they are prioritized, in, in being able to make these very important phone calls? 
thank you for your question. Max Greenstein, for the record. Um, I think that there are two perspectives from which we can look at your question. The first, um, certainly you do raise important points about um, the accessibility of phone calls. There's only so much infrastructure and we're looking to, um, to increase the use of that infrastructure. But I think from another perspective, the status quo is that the state is charging quite high rates um, to offenders and to the families of offenders to stay in contact with their family. And I think even if this bill doesn't serve to promote one more call, and even if hypothetically the system is at capacity, I think that we should still um, be lessening the burden of the cost of incarceration being passed on to families um, and making the calls that do exist between children and their incarcerated parents more accessible and less expensive. And then just as a follow-up, if I may, um, all telephone conversations from a convict to anyone is recorded. So would these continue to be recorded? Uh, yes, that's my understanding. They would continue okay. to be. So um, maybe an idea, it won't be a part of this bill, obviously, but I'm sure you'll be speaking with the directors of our, our prison system, that maybe there's a, a way in which you can portableize this, if you will, with cell phones that can be monitored that would decrease the cost for the prison system and allow for greater uh, participation and convicts being able to see their families. So I appreciate your creativity. I know you'll consider these things. Again, thank you for the presentation. And if I could just jump in, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, to youth legislator Greenstein's credit, um, we did reach out to the Department of Corrections, and I'm not sure if I brought him all the way back in the loop that um, if the if the prisons do switch to the tablets instead of phone calls, um, those the cost of a phone call will decrease exponentially, but the availability of them will increase exponentially. So um, that is a partial answer to your question, I think. Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Vice Chair. Well, Max, before your presentation, I was watching you and doing a fair amount of extemporaneous speaking myself. I was watching you mouth the words you were going to say as you were practicing. So it was very good. Uh, you did a great presentation. But um, so um, I was enjoying watching you getting prepared mentally to do, an, you know, it's very easy. Most of us are so intimidated by public speaking that we read, right? But you had it all up here. Good job. Uh, question the surplus fund of $14 million. Now, I'm, if, I, if I remember right, the, those funds are individual accounts, though, aren't they? Doesn't each prisoner have his own account, or is there? Like, are we talking different funds? So each offender, uh, Max Greenstein, for the record. Um, so each offender uh, has a personal account that they can use to cover things like commissary, buying chips at the canteen, etc. Um, but this uh, offender store fund, the name gets a little bit confusing but it's actually a separate um, special revenue fund um, established pursuant to NRS 209.221, established by the legislature. Um, and this is basically a bank account that the department has that is funded by profits that they make from commissary, from phone calls, et cetera. So this isn't an individualized fund um, as much as it is like an account um, that is pre-existing um, from the department. Good, I'm glad to clarify that. Now question, if the funding for that is at least partially um, paid for by the very things they're charging, the use of the phones. If you make it free calls, what level will that drop? And is there enough money in the system? Because I have no idea how many total calls we're talking, but while we're providing free calls for the inmates to their families, there still must be a cost, because you said it's an it's a independent contractor that provides the service. If we get rid of, if we make it free, how much are we going to decrease that account, and will that, with time, decrease the point where we won't even cover the cost of the free calls? Uh, Max Greenstein, for the record. So I will emphasize that we're not trying to make all calls free. Um, so there will still be calling revenue that can go into the offender store fund. And then I'll also note that of that $14 million surplus, uh, money made from phone calls constitutes the minority. I believe that NDOC is projecting $1.2 million to be made from uh, phone calls this year out of a total of $14 million. So by reducing the amount, by reducing that $1.2 million number, there would still be an abundance of, of money in this fund that comes from sources outside of phone calls. 
Good. Now we are talking to about changing the tablets and other things and other bills, and this is a pilot program, so what you're promoting. So I think it's a great idea. Um, the only question is, do we currently, do you know, does the state actually have a contract with a phone company where we, you know, where they agree to make, a, you know, 50 cents a minute or something on calls? Or are we, in effect, violating a potential contract between an independent contractor and, and the prison system? Um, so that, that is, that's an important, Max Green said for the record, that is an important consideration. And um, this bill would not necessarily alter any contract that currently exists with um, a phone provider. And that um, through the offender store fund, through gifts, grants, bequeathments, donations, and other sources of money, the, um, the company would still be making the same amount per phone call. Um, we're not proposing to completely eliminate payments to um, the company for these phone calls. Instead, we're, we're, uh, we're, we, we are suggesting that um, the department cover that cost for families through the offender store fund and then through the other sources of money that we've set out in the bill. Great. So they're still getting paid, just who's paying it is what we're talking about. Exactly. Very good. A great presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Additional questions from committee members? Okay, not seeing any, the hard part is over, uh, and we will open it up for testimony. Anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 234, please feel free to fill the seats. Ladies first, Nick. Okay. Good afternoon, Senate Committee on Judiciary. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Youth Legislator Stella Thornton from Senate District 16, and I am here to testify in support of Senate Bill 234. As written in a research article by Danielle Hevercate, the children of prisoners can suffer from behavioral issues, poor school performance, and a heightened risk of crime and delinquency. This bill is designed to facilitate and encourage a continuing relationship between offenders and the children of offenders with this pilot program. It is immensely important to establish parent-child relationships. UNICEF states, a positive early bond lays the ground for children to grow up to become happy, independent adults. Loving, secure relationships help build resilience, their ability to cope with challenges and recover from setbacks. Generations of incarceration are costly to the state, but even more so costly to the offenders who see their children repeating their mistakes. The stories from incarcerated parents that Youth Legislator Greenstein provided to you all in the supplemental resource list are incredibly moving and stress the need for this program. I encourage you all to read them with an open mind and an open heart. Please join me in supporting SB 234 to pioneer a better tomorrow for offenders and their children. Thank you. My name is Sherry Sampson, S-H-E-R-I-S-A-M-S-O-N. I come before you as a resident of Fallon, Nevada. In the past, I worked in the California State Correctional System for many years. I have witnessed the obvious struggles that families and children deal with during the incarceration of a parent. I am in support of SB 234 if it is being considered through the eyes of a child that is left behind by their incarcerated parent. In many cases, especially the rural locations of our state prisons, if you take that into consideration, a majority of these children will never physically visit their parent in the prison. Whoever is caring for these children are usually faced with financial constraints along with added day-to-day -day stressors and the factual limitations of transportation to any prison. In most cases, the child's ability to hear the parent's voice again is decided by the cost of a phone call, which means the child is serving time in their own way. If vetted appropriately and rolled out with positive guidelines and proper funding, I personally know that any child would benefit from this as a true gift. To hear a parent's voice, it could erase their imaginations as they think that a parent no longer may exist or has completely forgotten about them. There could be less worry, less agitation, and less alienation between both the child and that parent. 
I see this as a pioneering social component in the prison system, which would deal with the isolation that these innocent children are facing as they are living with a parent that is behind bars. If passed, this could literally be identified as the call to the child bill. And if anyone is interested, I used to read, a, uh, facilitate a book reading program with the incarcerated adult and their child with um, books that we had previously arranged for. And it was a very prosperous program in California. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris and committee members. My name is Nick Shepak, N-I-C-K-S-H-E-P-A-C-K, -E and I am the State Deputy Director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center, at least for now. I think uh, Mr. Greenstein has a couple years before graduation and may be gunning for my position here. Um, I want to start by saying how by saying how immensely impressed I am by Mr. Greenstein. Um, I first got introduced to him, not directly, but from leaders in this space from around the country who had reached out to me to make sure that I had connected with him. People in New York and people in Chicago. He has done his research and brought a bill, and the culmination was a present, the presentation you saw today. Um, this is an area that we work in, the cost of incarceration. We have other legislation that will bring to light um, a lot more on many of the questions you asked. Uh, the funding for the offender store fund, phone call costs, um, all of these things. And what we have here is a bill that is a pilot program that is going to allow kids to talk to their family, which all studies show is a huge indicator of reduced recidivism and, and mental health wellness for children. Uh, the evidence that we will collect from this um, pilot program and study will be able to lead us to make better decisions in future legislation, um, and it's just extremely well thought through. Uh, the money's there. I don't think that's something we need to worry about. And I think the money that we save from ensuring that we reduce recidivism and that kids uh, have improved mental health, better school outcomes, is going to be a huge savings to the state. This is a amazing bill. We're extremely proud to support it, and we hope you do too. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jody Hawking, J-O-D-I-H-L-C-K-I-N-G. And most of you know or have heard me talk about the fact that I'm the founder and executive director of Return Strong, which is an organization that represents, um, we're now over 3,000 incarcerated people and we are now also over 1,000 families. Um, what you may not know is that I also have, my husband is incarcerated in the state of Nevada and we have spent years and luckily had the privilege that I was able to afford phone minutes, but I've seen the impact of what happens to children when they lose contact with that parent. It happens for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because of money. Sometimes families just can't afford minutes. Your grandparent working and raising your grandkids while your child is incarcerated and you can't afford phone minutes, and so those kids lose contact. You are um, effectively a single parent while your loved one is incarcerated and you're already dealing with now taking on all of the financial costs of that but this is important stuff imagine if you couldn't sit at the table with your kid and do math with them or read a bedtime story or all of those simple things that we do with kids when we're raising them um, to be able to build connection um, not yesterday Wednesday I attended the pardons board and um, there was a man that received a pardon he'd been incarcerated for 45 years and his two adult daughters testified they're in their 40s now obviously over 45 um, and both of them testified to how influential he has been in building their character and using the the choices that he made that landed him in prison to help them alleviate that. Without that phone contact and the ability to talk and see their parent, both of them testified at the pardons board that they would not be the women that they are now. They're in college, they're 
you know, raising their families and there has been no generational cycle of that, but they were able to maintain those connections. And so I just want to say that I hope people understand that no matter who your family is or where your family's from, whether your loved one is incarcerated or homeless or addicted to drugs, every family has strengths. And this bill lets us build on those strengths for every family. Thank you. John Pirro for the record from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. This is such a great bill, and it was such a great bill presentation. Frankly, uh, we should bring him back for all of our bill presentations. Uh, I strongly urge your support of this measure. Love is part of what tethers us to this world, and maintaining that connection with a family member, even Director Zorinda has said, that is what keeps people going when they're inside and also keeps them uh, going on the right track when they get out. And I think this bill would go a long way to help fix that. Thank you. Tanya Brown, spelled T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, advocates for the inmates. I echo all the previous comments made here today. And I would like to personally thank youth leader Greenstein for the wonderful, spectacular presentation he gave. Wonderful. Um, I really can't really say much on what has already been said. But I will tell you that keeping the lines of communications open between a parent and a child is instrumental in keeping that bond together for both of them. Also, when families who are financially struggling, the calls do become far and in between. There is a distance there. And sometimes the children feel because they don't know it's a money situation and they might think, did I do something wrong? And so that kind of weighs on them. But I want to go to another part of it. Being someone who has been a part of this going back 35 years and watching my children as toddlers grow up into adulthood, having a loved one call and having that communication is wonderful. I'll tell you what it was. Every Saturday morning, 10 a.m., that phone would ring. And it would be a fight between my children on who was going to get that collect call first. And it continued all the way through their adult life, um, as long as they were in the house, you know, but they moved out. But I'm just telling you, it is so important to keep this communication between the parent and the child. They do grow up. Um, with they, it, is, it, it, is, it is just a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Thank you. Hello, Hana Fahmi, H-A-N-A-F-A-H-M-I. I'm testifying on behalf of CAA, Children's Advocacy Alliance. Ditto, and uh, as everyone said, you are a full role model, so it is great to be part of this. Thank you. Okay, we'll go down to um, Las Vegas. If there's anyone in Las Vegas who wants to testify in support of Senate Bill 234, come on up. Okay, looks like we have some takers. Go ahead and state your name for the record whenever you're ready. My name is Pamela Browning, P-A-M-E-L-A-B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G. I just want to share um, how this is affected me and my loved one. Um, he's been incarcerated for eight years. He has four children and I am the main contact between him and his children. So with making sure he gets enough time with each one of them, it has been costing me at least up to $450 a month just on the phone calls. Uh, with four children and only 15 minutes, sometimes one call just isn't enough. Like I said, he has been away for eight years, and keeping this connection and bond between him and his children is very important. One of his sons was having a very hard time forgiving him, having abandonment issues, doing really bad in school. But because of the constant connection um, through these phone calls, he was able to forgive his dad, and they are now moving on to a better moving forward. I am currently working more than one job just to try to maintain everything here and there for him. I am in full support of SB 234, as not only will it continue to help my loved one, but all those that have children and not, and not the finances for constant contact. It's very important for all parties during this time. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Bridget Duffy for the record, B-R-I-G-I-D-D-U-F-F-Y. I am the Assistant District Attorney in Clark County over the Juvenile Division. And I am unbelievably humbled now that I've seen this presentation that Youth Legislator Greenstein reached out to me specifically to review this bill and see if there was a way I could fit into any type of support. Um, of course, immediately upon reviewing the bill, I thought about our children in foster care that I deal with every day. Um, and when those incarcerated parents need to rely on relatives to care for those children um, during that period of incarceration, this bill will open up some avenues for them to maintain that connection without the added expense to families and fictive kin. It's also going to, when appropriate, maintain that relationship with our children who we see with some extensive behavioral needs when they feel as if their parent has abandoned them and it would be in that best interest of that child to maintain that relationship. So again, thank you, Youth Legislator Greenstein, for allowing me to be a part of this today, Senator Scheibel for sponsoring the bill, and Clark County Department of Family Services supports it. All right, BPS, can we please check the phone lines, see if there's anyone on the phone to support Senate Bill 234? Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support of SB 234, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Avon Hart Johnson. For the record, it's spelled A-V-O-N-H-A-R-T hyphen J-O-H-N-S-O-N. I am pleased to provide testimony today in support of the legislation SB 234, an act to, uh, to provide incarcerated parents with the ability to communicate with their child cost free. I'm the president and founder of DC Project Connect, which is a community-based organization that liaises with other like-minded organizations across the nation, including Nevada. As in my current role as the Advocacy and Action Coalition chairperson, our, our goal is to ensure the well-being of families and children affected by incarceration across the nation. Outside of advocacy, I am a researcher, and I've conducted multiple studies, both domestically and abroad, and they give us the same message, that incarceration can affect families and thereby traumatizing them. Our research specifically focuses on how families are affected by incarceration. Through my research and firsthand experiences, we have learned how important it is for communication to occur between parents and children. In fact, it might bridge the gap between a child feeling loved and supported versus feeling abandoned and isolated from their parents. As you are aware, many families are facing extreme financial challenges and this bill is proposed to help with that matter. Separation has adverse consequences on children especially when contact is not maintained. Besides the possible traumatic exposure based on separation and even stigma, a child's relationship with their parents plays an important role in offsetting potentially psychologically distressing symptoms. This is a consistent form, this consistent form of contact may be more imperative for the child than adult. According to Pullman et al., an essential part of child development is as it relates to parental incarceration is to build secure attachment bonds. The critical years for those attachments are for children before they reach the age of 18. Unaddressed, as you know, many children may also face adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. ACEs can lead to toxic stress, which disrupts the normal growth and development of a child. Children with four or more ACEs have shown a decrease in life expectancy of 
20 years, persons who have experienced four or more categories of childhood ACEs exposure compared to those who had none had a four to 12 fold increase of health, health risks including alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicide attempts. However, there is good news. We can offset these possible, possible adversities by taking purposeful and deliberate steps, such as SB 234. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I appreciate the support and the remarkable work that has gone in this legislation, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here and to support this legislation. And I'll take any questions. No questions during, uh, during uh, testimony at this time. Thank you. BPS, will you check to see if there are any other callers in support? We can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee, and thank you to Max Springsteen for the, and the bill sponsors for bringing this bill forward. My name is Denise Bolaños. For the record, it is spelled D-E-N-I-S-E-B-O-L-A-N-O-S, -E -E and I am a resident of Carson City and personally impacted by incarceration, and I would like to express my support this afternoon for SB 234. It's so important for a child's emotional and mental health to be able to maintain a semblance of a normal relationship with their parent through incarceration, and the cost of phone calls should not be an impediment for those relationships to thrive. Speaking from my family, based on our monthly statement and breakdown of costs by Securus, which is the company calls are made through currently in Nevada, uh, just one 30-minute phone call a day every day adds up to roughly $150 to $200 a month, which isn't easily afforded by our family. And when you take into consideration multiple children and blended families, those costs go up considerably, which is our case. And so we limit the calls to a few minutes per person every other day at best, and that bare minimum contact just won't do to build and maintain relationships. Let's ease the burdens of families who are already facing so many challenges by being impacted by incarceration by supporting this bill. Thank you. Once again, if you are new to the call and would like to testify in support of SB 34, 234, I'm sorry, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Cavello, and I would like to speak on uh, behalf of my grandchildren. I have two that live in Florida. My son was previously incarcerated at the time of his incarceration. My grandson was 14 years old. Uh, his mother, uh, my grandson's mother, now tells me that my grandson felt so alone. He felt like he had no connection with his father. He felt abandoned. Obviously, they weren't able to visit him, him being incarcerated in Nevada. And now my grandson has an alcoholism problem at a very young age. And I, I do feel that this is partly because of the lack 
of communication with his father. His younger sister, my granddaughter, beautiful girl, has tried to commit suicide two times. I really feel that they need to have that communication with their parents. To me, this is more about the children because I've seen how my grandchildren suffer. I am in full support of this bill. Thank you very much. Chair, there are no more callers at this time. Okay, we will come uh, back here to Carson City for anyone who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 234. All right, not seeing anyone. Is there anyone in Las Vegas who'd like to testify in opposition? That is also a negative. Let's see if there's anyone on the phone lines, please. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 234, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in the neutral position? All right, Las Vegas. Okay, let's check. Oh, Las Vegas, we got a taker. Go ahead, sir. All right, good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris, uh, Senator Harris, and esteemed members of the Senate Judiciary. I'm James Jones, Inspector General with the Nevada Department of Corrections. First, I would like to say uh, and acknowledge what a great job youth legislator Max Greenstein did uh, a great presentation as a well thought out bill. Um, the NDOC is hopeful with the potential implement implementation of Assembly Bill 35 and the opportunity for increased communication and family reunification. Most of the goals posed in Senate Bill 234 will be addressed. At this time, the NDOC stands neutral on Senate Bill 234. We thank Senator Scheibel and youth legislator Max. Um, Grinstein for uh, these efforts and look forward to working on the legislation to address some concerns regarding implementation and other requirements included within. Uh, as, similar, uh, as before, we were already tracking BDR 6 from the youth legislature and um, have completed some preliminary research determining the potential impact and challenges enactment of this legislation may have. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, if you could uh, turn off the mic on your end, please. On your end, please. Thanks so much. Um, since this is the department that would be implementing this bill, I'll entertain some questions from committee members if they'd like briefly. Okay, no questions for you, sir. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, is there anyone on the phone who'd like to testify neutral for Senate Bill 234? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 234, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chairwoman Harris and members of the committee. My name is Wiz Rizar, W-I-Z, last name R-O-U-Z-A-R-D, Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity. And I just actually want to utilize this time to really thank Max Greenstein on an amazing presentation, as most people have shared. Uh, that was also a well-thought-out presentation all around. And we just wanted to take the time to say thank you, Max, for all of your hard work, and we hope you keep it up. Thank you, Chair. 
All right. Um, Madam Secretary, we will go ahead and count that as testimony in support, please. Okay, uh, BPS, is there anyone else on the phone line for neutral testimony? There are no further comments, Chair. Okay, any closing comments that you'd like to make? Come on up. I will say I've spent my whole career trying to get no opposition on a bill, and you've done it on your first one, so well done. Thank you. Well, um, it's a Friday afternoon. It's cold outside. There's another bill on the agenda, so I'll keep my remarks short. Um, I just want to emphasize that I think this is a straightforward piece of legislation. Um, it's to benefit families, and we look forward to working with committee members and the department to address any areas where the bill could be improved. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And while a lot of folks here are encouraging you to go into the public sector, uh, there are quite a few f people who work for the state who present to us regularly who could use your consulting. So uh, I think there is a private business for you as well. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 234, and we will stand in brief recess uh, at the call of the vice chair. Okay, committee will come back to order and we will open up the hearing on Senate Bill 235. Welcome back our esteemed chair, Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. I think I made a mistake by doing this bill second because now I have to follow youth legislator Greenstein, um, but I'm going to try, okay? So um, SB 235 is fairly short and um, this is a bill about pretrial release, which is something that we've talked about a lot in Senate Judiciary and also in the Assembly, for those of you who served in the Assembly on the Judiciary Committee. Um, so basically, uh, to give a little bit of history, uh, the Nevada Supreme Court uh, made the Valdez Jimenez decision in 2020 or sometime before 2021. And when we came to the session in 2021, we codified that decision that requires that um, every person who is arrested get a pretrial release hearing in a reasonable time um, and imposes the least restrictive means necessary to ensure their return to court and the safety of the community. Um, as is always the case when you make a, a large change like that in the criminal justice system, there were some uh, finer points to be worked out. And um, so this bill addresses a couple of the issues that we've seen since the implementation of the legislation for the 2021 session to today. So um, I want to draw your attention to three different amendments that have been posted online. Um, one of them is prepared by Senator Harris, and this one is a friendly amendment. So I'm going to speak to that amendment at the same time that I speak to the structure of SB 235, because um, it's not a very complicated bill. Basically, um, it does two things. Well, with the amendment, it does three things. So the, the first thing that it does um, in subsection two is it 
clarifies that if a pretrial release hearing is going to be continued, it can be continued either at the prosecutor's request, the defense's request, or the court can um, make their own request of themselves to continue it for good cause. Um, and then the second thing that the bill does is it clarifies that the parties can also stipulate to continue a pretrial release hearing. So for example, um, in it, where I've seen this utilized, um, especially as in serious cases like murder cases, when both the prosecution and the defense know that the person is not going to be released on their own recognizance within 48 hours, um, but they do want some time to for the defense to get to know their client, for the prosecution to get to know their case, to figure out what they are going to argue for. If they're going to argue for cash bail, how much cash bail, for the defense attorney to figure out if their client can make any kind of monetary bail, what, whether they'd be eligible for house arrest, those kinds of things. So in those cases, when both the prosecutor and the defense attorney come to the judge and say, judge, we would like to continue this hearing for a week, the judge is allowed to accept that stipulation and move the hearing to that, that date that's agreed upon by the parties. Um, and I wanted to clarify in the bill that that stipulation can be oral, written, email, telephone, so it doesn't have to be any prescribed form that's notarized or something like that. It could be as simple, especially we're you know, thinking about our rural jurisdictions where they might not have a calendar of 75 pretrial hearings. They might have two people in custody um, on a particular day, and if the prosecutor and defense attorney talk to each other and they call over to chambers and say, hey, we've agreed to, um, you know, con to continue both of these hearings until your regularly scheduled calendar on Wednesday, then that phone call would suffice. Um, and so the the amendment, the conceptual amendment in prepared by Senator Harris, um, also fixes something else that we overlooked back in 2021. I think it's fair to say we overlooked it. And um, this relates to what happens when somebody has already been released and they violate one of their conditions of release and end up back in custody. Uh, once somebody, so for example, if at that 48 hour hearing, um, and this is very common with my clients, I represent a lot of uh, people who are accused of DUI, DUI, uh, the judge might say, you know, I'm going to release you, you can't have any alcohol, and you have to come back to court in two months. And then they are stopped, not driving, but they are stopped for disorderly conduct and they're clearly intoxicated, they're arrested. Um, the judge is notified that the person is back in custody and so we come before the judge again and the person's violated one of the conditions of their release. Um, inadvertently, the, uh, the previous the NRS right now says that that judge can um, increase bail or revoke bail. It doesn't say that they could also impose additional conditions. Um, and where in the example that I gave, probably the most logical thing to do in that case and what most judges I've encountered would want to do is put that person on an alcohol monitor. And so we want to give the judges the ability to impose additional conditions. Um, doesn't mean that they can't increase bail, uh, revoke bail if appropriate, but just gives them that flexibility to also impose additional conditions as a response to violating the previous conditions. Um, you also received amendments from the Nevada District Attorneys Association, Nevada Association of Counties, Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities, and the Nevada Urban Consortium. And um, this amendment makes a very significant change to the state of the law to extend the timing of a pretrial release hearing from 48 hours to 72 hours. Uh, this is not a friendly amendment, and the reason that you have the amendment in front of you is that I am um, sure that the four organizations that came together to develop this amendment have been talking to you, just like they've been talking to me, about this request to extend the time from 48 hours to 72 hours. And so I thought it was only fair that we all um, be on the same page about what the request is. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think it's important for the committee to know that they did come to me with an amendment. When they talk to you about their request, it's not, um, you know, an empty request without a, an amendment. They, they went through the process, they brought me the amendment, I rejected the amendment, but I want you to see it anyway. Um, the same is true of the Nevada District Attorneys Association amendment, um, which it doesn't do quite the same thing. Um, that one specifies good cause 
in the case of being unable to contact a victim in a timely fashion. Um, and again, I, I, I've worked with these organizations a lot. They have excellent um, policy analysts and lobbyists in this building who will probably be talking to you about these issues. So I thought it was only fair that you guys got to see the amendments as well, um, even though I, I don't consider them to be friendly amendments. And with that, um, I would be happy to take any questions. Committee members, any questions? Senator Stone, did you have a question, sir? Yes. Okay, we'll go to you first and then Senator Krasner. Thank you, Senator Scharbel, for your presentation on this. Uh, just two questions. Um, one, uh, if the parties stipulate, can they do this more than once? And the second thing is, um, I'm con concerned about the definition of next regularly scheduled calendar. As you know, courts can be pretty jammed up. They have their schedules in advance. So uh, I don't know if you really intend it to be the day, the first court date after the agree to the stipulation, or would you, is it preferable to say it's not regularly scheduled available calendar date? So thank you. So Melanie Scheibel for the record, and I'll speak first to your first question. Um, I don't see any reason that the parties couldn't continue to stipulate to the continuance because it's a stipulation. If at some point one party wants to continue and the other one doesn't, that's when you gotta go in front of a judge. Um, as to your second question, so um, that the regular, the continuation to the next regularly scheduled calendar is separate and apart from the stipulation because the stipulation could be in three weeks. Um, the purpose of requiring the court to continue the matter to the next regularly scheduled calendar is because a lot of our rural courts meet on a very protracted schedule. We're talking every 14 days. And so um, the, the intent of the bill is yes, even if you have a very busy calendar, if you have continued somebody's hearing um, you know, in that 14 day window, you're gonna have to add it to that next regularly scheduled calendar. Um, for the more urban areas that have calendar, actually, I'll give you another example. Um, Henderson Justice Court, each department doesn't have a calendar every single day. They do have a bail calendar every day, but you know, if you're already assigned to a particular department and they're going to be continuing your case, um, the purpose is to say that um, you do have to come back if, you know, if you're there on a Thursday and the judge finds good cause to continue, that judge's next calendar would end up being the next Wednesday. And so then th they would have to calendar it for that Wednesday. You can't kick it to what I think would be the following Monday would be their next calendar. Um, but for the, for for the, um, for the courts that meet every day, so like the Las Vegas Justice Court, um, they would have to move it to the next day unless there was a stipulation to move it beyond just one day. Can a judge that has this calendar, can, can he reject that uh, himself? Uh, if he gets a buy-in from the other two attorneys, he probably can, but he can't unilaterally say, no, it, I, I don't have any room in my calendar today. It's got to be Tuesday. Melanie Scheibel for the record. Correct. That's the intent. Senator Krasner. Additional questions from committee members? Okay. I have a question. Would you consider um, it being a holiday or it being a weekend as good cause to continue one of these cases? That's not the purpose of this legislation to um, allow for continuing outside, of, continuing to avoid weekends and holidays. Um, that I, I, I wouldn't consider that good cause and we're not trying to include them in the good cause here. Okay, thank you. All right, Senator Wynn. I, I was taking, I appreciate you um, including um, the amendments, even if they were not um, included. And I, I do have um, a question about, um, I believe it is in the Nevada District Attorneys Association amendment. And there's a section that they were um, attempting to include, including good cause, um, to continue um, when there's insufficient time to contact a victim of crime pursuant to Marcy's law. Um, 
Do you think that's already included in the ability to ask for that continuance or no? Melanie, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, yes, I, I do think that is included. And I think that um, that's the purpose of having a judge be able to rule on good cause um, because every case is different. And so uh, depending on the timing of the arrest, the timing of the pretrial release hearing and the relationship with the victim, absolutely, it could be good cause that um, for the district attorney to move for continuance based on not having had the ability to discuss the case with the victim. And just a follow-up question. Um, I know that several of us, I know this is a policy committee, but I know during the interim there was lots of conversations about the inability to staff some of these courts um, on the weekend, um, in particular in the rural counties. Um, I know some of, several of us sit on the finance um, committee, so we've heard that this is a real problem. Um, would that be something that could potentially be contemplated as a good cause reason if there aren't this staff to be able to do this? Is that a determination a judge could also make? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, I, I suppose that they could. Um, and I'm not the arbiter of good cause, obviously. That's literally a judge's job. But I think that um, th that would be a valid consideration. And also, this isn't the question that you asked, but I think that the um, the staffing issues, the cost associated with holding these trials is a real concern that I'm hoping we'll be able to address during this legislative session. Uh, you know, this bill doesn't solve that problem, but we should be looking at some other ways to um, alleviate those financial pressures as well, or capacity pressures as well. Okay, with that, we will open it up for testimony at this time. Thank you, Chair. Is there anyone here who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 235? Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris, Chair Scheibel, and members of the committee. For the record, Mary Walker, representing Douglas County, Lyon County, and Story Counties. We rise in support of SB 235 regarding pretrial release hearings, and we sincerely thank the leadership of Chair Scheibel, Senator Wynn, and the members of this committee for looking for solutions to help rectify the significant problems which arose when the 2021 legislature required a pretrial release hearing within 48 hours after arrest. Our greatest concern in rural Nevada is the impact on our judges and staff. To give you an example of how things work in rural Nevada, we have a judge in a smaller jurisdiction who now works all week and now every weekend. She doesn't take vacations. She trained herself on her staff's computer system to record her decision on pretrial release, so she is not only doing the work of a judge, but the work of staff, so her staff doesn't have to work weekends and holidays. This is the type of people we have in the rurals working in the rural justice system. They have dedicated their lives to serving justice in their communities. However, this is not sustainable. We have excellent judges in the rurals, and this is borne out by the fact that there are very few complaints on our rural courts. My greatest fear is unless we have a sustainable system that these judges and their staff can operate under, we will lose them. As you are aware, the rurals have a difficult time attracting professionals, whether it is a doctor, a nurse, teacher, or lawyer. We need a judicial system that does not exacerbate this problem. I believe if we lose our judges and staff, which we are already starting to see, there will be a degradation of Nevada's rural court system. Who will be attracted to a seven day 365 day per year job with limited pay. Please help us retain our Nevada judges. We're already seeing a degradation in the rural courts due to the staffing problems. I'd be willing to work with all parties to come to a solution to make the Nevada judicial system sustainable for our judges and staff. And again, I want to express our greatest appreciation to Chair Scheibel and members of this committee for their efforts to try to rectify these problems but we do need to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pirro. 
Good afternoon, committee. John Pure from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. I want to thank Senator Scheibel and this committee for bringing this bill forward. Uh, last session, uh, this body passed AB 424 and SB 369 with broad-based bipartisan support. It wasn't just one party pushing elements of legislation through, and I think it's because this body recognized that prompt means prompt, and that when you're arrested, the presumption of innocence stands, and that you should have a prompt pretrial determination on whether or not you should be released. I think when you're looking at the Nevada District Attorneys Association's uh, unfriendly amendment and they bring up Marcy's Law, sometimes Marcy's Law can be used as a, a sword and a shield. They say, well, the victim should be notified, but us, the district attorney, shouldn't have the duty to notify them. And the police say, well, they should be notified, but we shouldn't have the duty to notify them. And the court says we shouldn't do that. So we keep passing the buck on. But I think the easiest way to make sure that they are notified is that saying when somebody gets picked up, within 48 hours they're going to have a hearing and you will be available to be there. There's a set hearing time that you will be able to be there and be able to respond and be heard on your concerns without anybody passing the buck on who should notify the victim to be able to ex exert their constitutional right. Uh, I think this is a good common sense piece of legislation that's trying to fix some of the issues that we've run into. I think the system does need a little bit more time to pan out and see what it really does look like before we start tinkering with it since we just changed it two years ago. Uh, so I'm grateful for this body bringing this piece of legislation forward. I would say uh, please at this time do not consider the unfriendly amendments and move forward with the legislation with the conceptual amendment uh, that Senator Harris put forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pirro. Um, anyone else here in Carson City for support? All right, we will head down to Las Vegas. Anyone in Las Vegas to testify in support of Senate Bill 235? Okay, not seeing any BPS. Could you please check the phone lines? If you would like to testify in support of SB 35, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers at this time, Chair. All right, thank you. We will come back here to Carson City then for testimony in opposition. If there's anyone who wants to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 235, go ahead and take the seats. Ms. Noble, go ahead and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris, and good afternoon to you and members of the committee and to Chair Scheibel. Um, my name is Jennifer Noble, for the record, and I represent the Nevada District Attorneys Association, which, as you probably know, rep represents the 17 elected district attorneys throughout Nevada. So pursuant to committee rules, we are testifying in opposition to SB 235 as written because it doesn't address, in our, in our view, the ongoing logistical and financial and practical conundrums that continue to be faced by our rural jurisdictions. But I wanna sincerely thank Chair Scheibel um, for letting us at least put those amendments up on Nellis and for taking the time to talk to us about some of the ongoing challenges that we're continuing to face, especially in our rural jurisdictions when it comes to pretrial hearings. And we hope to continue those conversations. Um, there are two amendments, um, as the chair mentioned, neither have been accepted by her, um, but we do appreciate your opportunity to review them. One amendment, uh, as she mentioned, is from NACO, the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities, the Nevada Urban Consortium, and of course the Nevada District Attorneys Association. And the other is exclusively a Nevada District Attorneys Association amendment. And I'm being cognizant of my two minutes here, so I apologize if I speak quickly. 
Uh, to be clear, we don't dispute that people who are arrested should have their pretrial hearing promptly. This is not a philosophical debate about that. It's not a moral debate about that. We agree with it. The problem is we had legislation last session that made changes requiring 48 hours in all of our counties, in all of our jurisdictions, but without providing the resources or the tools necessary to make them workable for all of Nevada, not just Washoe County, not just Clark County. Uh, we have some DA's offices with one attorney. We have some with two. We have one with 160 attorneys. And last session, uh, prosecutors and judges from the rural jurisdictions made clear um, that in some of our areas in Nevada, the existing resources and personnel make compliance with the 48 hours very burdensome and impracticable. That doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. It means they're having a lot of trouble making it happen. And that should be important to the people who represent them. Uh, we reminded this committee uh, last session that legislation has to keep in mind all of Nevada as I referenced, and I know that you try to do that. And during the interim Judiciary Committee, judges of limited jurisdiction appeared and explained the hardships that they continued to face, staff shortages, technology issues, um, even uh, the problem with defense attorneys who are on contract basis not being willing to work seven days a week. These are all problems that are still happening in our rural jurisdictions. We either need more time, but if more time is not a possibility, then we need more resources and more tools, and I hope to work with you to figure out how that can happen. Um, we're more than willing to work with Chair Scheibel, this committee, and all the stakeholders to make sure that arrested persons received a prompt hearing, no matter where they're at in Nevada. The two amendments uploaded on Nellis, um, the first one is uh, the one that's from the Nevada District Attorney's Association, NACO, League of Cities, and the Nevada Urban Consortium, and it seeks to modify the existing law to exclude weekends and legal holidays uh, from that 48 hours. And I understand that that's not something that Chair Scheibel wants to do, and I anticipate members of this committee will be very opposed to that. But understand, it's not because of a lack of understanding that people deserve a prompt hearing. It's because we don't have the funding or the resources um, in all of our jurisdictions. Uh, additionally, NDAA has submitted its own amendment. It modifies uh, the law in two ways. First, it provides that either party securing a continuance, when either party secures a continuance, the pretrial release hearing, the court's not obligated to place the hearing back on the next scheduled calendar. And the reason for this are a couple of quick examples I'll give you. Um, for example, if a defense attorney in a murder case says he wants to continue the Valdez hearing to an arraignment, the court should be able to continue the arraignment. And in Clark County, that's typically two days away. So a mandatory deadline on the next calendar date puts the hearing before the scheduled arraignment and often before a criminal complaint is filed. And a lot of times the defense attorney might request that, but the DA doesn't feel comfortable stipulating to that. So then we get into a situation where if the DA doesn't stipulate, what happens? And there's, there's obviously an efficiency issue there. Um, the amendment provides judges with the discretion under appropriate circumstances to forego sending an additional hearing, which will be again continued based on good cause shown by the defense or the prosecution. I'll wrap it up because I know I'm almost out of time or probably out of time. Um, the NDAA amendment also provides that a court shall find good cause to continue a pretrial release hearing when there's not been enough time for the victim to be heard, consistent with their constitutional rights. And whether you agree with Marcy's law or not, it is part of the constitution of this state. And I do take some issue with the suggestion that district attorneys in this state are passing the buck when it has to do with informing victims of their rights and making sure they know when that hearing is. It is not just our responsibility, but in my office, the Washoe County District Attorney's Office, we undertake that responsibility very seriously and we make every effort to make sure they know when that hearing is. But consider a sexual assault victim. In 48 hours, they may have just finished their sexual assault exam. They may have just finished that SANE exam. They might need a little extra time to go home, maybe take a shower now that the evidence has been collected, care for themselves, maybe get an hour of sleep before they have to face their assailant at a pretrial release hearing. That certainly is not going to apply in every case, but we should be able to request a reasonable period of time so that they can be heard um, in, in in consistently with their rather their constitutional rights. Um, with that, I will thank you for your time. I do have specific examples of how this is not working in our rural jurisdictions, but I know I've well exceeded my two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Noble, and this committee very much looks forward to getting the list of resources that you need to make the 48 hours happen, and I 
commit to you that we are all partners in that, but I don't have that before us. So what you need, we're, we're, we're happy to take a look and, and consider and do our best efforts to get that to you all. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris and members of the committee. Um, and I, this is Stephen Wood from the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities. I agree with you. Um, your last comments are appreciated and, and we want to be part of that conversation as well. Um, thank you, Chair Scheibel, for presenting this bill. I'm testifying in opposition, although I have no opposition to the bill as written, but I would love to see the amendment that we added our name to added to the bill, um, which is why I'm testifying in opposition, but also would like to continue uh, the conversations with Chair Scheibel and the committee as well as the other stakeholders on how we can make this work. And Mr. Wood, I'll just clarify, and I know the chair's done this a couple of times, uh, here in the Senate there is no rule that if you support the bill you must be in opposition because you'd like to see some more. So. Feel free to characterize your support as, as you'd like, but I just want to make that very clear so that folks don't feel the need to continue to come up in opposition just because they might have an amendment, especially when they support the bill as drafted. Stephen Wood, for the record, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Vice Chair and members of the uh, Judiciary Committee. My name is Keith Lee. I'm with Tom Clark Solutions. I'm here representing the Nevada Judges of Limited Jurisdiction today. Uh, as you all know, the Nevada, limited, the Nevada Judges of Limited Jurisdiction are the Justice of the Peace and the Municipal Court Judges in the state of Nevada. We are here in opposition to SB 235 as it is written. We at the judges view it as a violation of the separation of powers doctrine. Specifically, Article 6 of the Nevada Constitution creates the judiciary, including ju uh, justice and municipal courts, as a separate but equal branch of government with the executive and legislative branches. I will tell you, Section 8 of Article 6 does give the legislature certain powers over justices' court. Specifically, the legislature shall determine the number of justices of peace in each, in each uh, city and township, shall fix by law their qualifications, their terms of office, the limits of their civil and criminal jurisdiction, the nature of the case, and the penalty provided. The legislature shall also prescribe by law and determine the cases in which appeals may be, <coughs> excuse me, appeals may be taken. The Constitution, Nevada Constitution, does not grant the legislature the ability to tell justices' courts how to conduct their proceedings, including without limitation, when a matter and under what circumstances that matter should be continued and to what date it must be continued. The attempt to do so in SB 235, we believe, infringes upon the inherent authority of a justice court as granted by the Nevada Constitution. Recognizing that the constitutional issues that I've discussed will likely be settled in a different playing field, and that we, that we here in this building are dealing with solutions and, problem, and, and problems that we try to apply those solutions to, uh, let me say that we, the judges, uh, ad adopt in principle the outlining of the problems and possible solutions as set forth in the district attorney's letter that's part of the record here. And we also support uh, both of the amendments that have been discussed here uh, presented by the district attorney. Particularly, we uh, respect the fact that uh, Marcy's law should be considered. It is enshrined in our Constitution, so it should be considered. And we also uh, adopt and support the uh, amendment that was provided by the municipal uh, municipalities in our state. Uh, with that having said, uh, being said, Madam Vice Chair, um, we do appreciate uh, Senator Scheibel's willingness to talk with these uh, with us in these matters. Uh, Senator Harris and I have had conversations uh, dating back to last session on these matters as well. I think we all recognize that we need to work towards some solutions. With respect to these, I appreciate very much uh, Senator Scheibel's um, allowing the discussion on the two amendments that uh, she considers unfriendly amendments, and I understand why she considers them unfriendly amendments. Uh, but we pledge, as do the other stakeholders, to continue to work with you all up there, other members of the legislature, and certainly all the other stakeholders in trying to resolve some of these, some of these problems that we're discussing. I, I just might add that, particularly with respect to the the, the 
judges in the, in the smaller jurisdictions, and we appreciate what Ms. Walker said uh, about the judges. Um, I, I think that the judges and their staffing are not the only limitations. In fact, I would suggest that they probably aren't really the limitation to 48-hour hearings. We understand from the judge's perspective that uh, the, one of the biggest problems is just one, having prosecuting and defense counsel actually being able to meet uh, the defense counsel, meet with his or her client and uh, the, the uh, prosecuting attorney to understand what the charges are all about. Um, but having said that, uh, as I said, we are willing to work and we hope to work with everybody to try to solve these problems. With that, Madam Vice Chair, I appreciate uh, the time. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and just so the record is, is clear, I, I do believe the bill sponsor uh, suggested that Marcy's law and having trouble complying with that is a reason a judge upon their own wisdom may continue a case. Uh, so I don't want there to be any confusion that this bill as presented and intended by the sponsor uh, would not allow continuation in order to comply with Marcy's law. We'll go down to Las Vegas for opposition testimony. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Vice Chair Harris. My name is, and members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Mark Skifalakwa, S-C-H-I-F-A-L-A-C-Q-U-A, -A -A and I'm the head of the Criminal Division for the Henderson City Attorney's Office. I do want to say thank you to Chair Scheibel uh, for her consideration of the two amendments and her openness to continue discussions. We do uh, appreciate her kindness in, in those regards. I would say the bail and pretrial custody determinations must reflect a balance in the criminal justice system, namely a balance between a defendant having a prompt hearing after arrest and the consideration of those that the crime affected, namely the victim, and, and a chance to be reasonably be heard, which is the constitutional right of that victim. And we would say that the current law doesn't always reflect a proper balance. To be clear, the 48-hour rule uh, founded in AB 424 from last session is not mandated by either the state or the federal constitution, and thus it can be changed to accommodate everyone in the system. And we are asking for that change to be considered. Uh, the joint amendment would accommodate the rights of victims uh, to help ensure reasoned and informed bail decisions. Uh, currently, many times uh, defendants are arrested uh, just a few hours. It's not a full 48 hours, it's just a few hours prior to the hearing. Uh, it's very difficult to either get a victim to court, on the phone, or have their voice heard through an advocate. And while I agree that either party could ask for a continuance uh, based on good cause, there is no settled understanding of that phrase. It is not defined in the law, and it's not universally interpreted by the courts. But by building some more time into the calculation, into the system, or excluding one or more days from the week, we will have a greater likelihood of victims being able to have their voices heard that would provide some much needed balance. The extra time will also, I would say, encourage defendants to have greater participation in the system. Many times defendants are uh, under, under the influence or upset about the arrest and they don't come to the actual hearings. We have about a third of our hearings where the defendants are not appearing and so they either have to be continued or argued without them due to the time frame. So lastly, staffing issues are real, and I do appreciate the comments of everyone uh, today noting that. Once again, I do want to thank Chair Scheibel for her openness and willingness to discuss, and thank you, Vice Chair, for the time. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in Las Vegas who'd like to testify in opposition? Okay, not seeing anyone. BPS, could we go to the phone, see if there's anyone who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 235? If you would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 235, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Carly Halbert here, C-A-R-L-Y-H-E-L-B-E-R-T, Assistant City Attorney for the Las Vegas City Attorney's Office, testifying in opposition but supporting the amendment sponsored by the Nevada District Attorney's Association. I want to put on the record that we agree with the 
previous testimony regarding Markey's law. And just make note that prior to the enactment of AB 424, the Las Vegas City Attorney's Office was able to arraign all defendants at their first court appearance uh, when they were in custody. We now have a somewhat duplicative court appearance uh, within 48 hours of each other. Because we are unable to fully staff weekend hearings, we have a pretrial detention hearing on Saturday and holidays without the ability or time to file complaints. The complaints are drafted on Monday when we are fully staffed and the defendants are then arraigned 48 hours after their Saturday pretrial detention hearings. It is an inefficient use of resources for defendants, attorneys, and court staff. Resources that can be better utilized to prevent recidivism. Our office and the Las Vegas Municipal Court have committed to following the Nevada pretrial risk assessment tool for several years prior to the effective date of AB 424. As a result, any defendant who is a low risk was released on their own recognizance, almost always without conditions. Only defendants with high risk scores and who represent a public safety risk were detained an extra day or two over the weekend prior to their arraignment on Monday. Our office was also committed to notifying the court about any charges that were being denied over the weekend so that these defendants were not being detained over the weekend unnecessarily. While we recognize the constitutional right and import of a defendant's presumption of innocence, it is worth reminding the committee that with the exception of battery domestic violence and DUI, those charges which have a mandatory cooling off period, a defendant typically cannot be arrested on a misdemeanor crime unless the crime is committed in the officer's presence or because the defendant was cited and failed to appear in court resulting in a bench warrant. With the Las Vegas Municipal Court and the Las Vegas City Attorney's Office properly utilizing the Nevada Pre-Trial Risk Assessment Tool uh, mandated by the Nevada Supreme Court, the legislature's enactment of AB 424 last session did little more than create a significant financial burden to staff weekend hearings for high-risk individuals who committed a crime in front of an officer or have already appear, failed to appear in court when released. There is simply a much better use of these resources. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you on an amendment. Chair, there are no more callers for opposition at this time. Okay, uh, we will come here back to Carson City. Anyone want to testify in the neutral position for Senate Bill 235? All right, uh, anyone in Las Vegas want to testify in the neutral position? Okay, and BPS, can we please check the phones? Chair, there is no more callers for neutral at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Chair Scheibel, would you like to make any closing comments? Thank you so much, Vice Chair Harris. And I, I do uh, want to um, add a little bit more depth to the record here because I think that we have all been working, the people who've testified in opposition, those of you on the dais, we've all been working very hard to try to find a workable solution for the the codification of the Valdez Jimenez decision. And um, part of that is ensuring that people get a pretrial release hearing in a reasonable amount of time, which this legislature voted last session is 48 hours. That That is the, the Supreme Court essentially called on the legislature to determine what a reasonable time is and we came back with a response that it was 48 hours. Now when we did that we also built in some safety valves um, at the time. One of them was the good cause continuation. Another one was allowing justices of the peace to sit in different jurisdictions in order to allow them to develop a rotating schedule for their pretrial release hearings. A third one was to allow for all of these hearings to be done electronically, via video, or through some other technological means. And so in the interim, when we learned that a lot of the rural jurisdictions were struggling to make these hearings happen in 48 hours, we brought them back into the Interim Judiciary Committee. And that's actually where this bill comes from, because we had a hearing at the Interim Judiciary Committee where we discussed possible solutions to the challenges of having the hearings within 48 hours. And so first, we asked the justices of the peace, we asked the rural jurisdictions via NACO and the District Attorneys Association, why those guidelines, those safety valves that we had already put into the legislation weren't working. And um, 
Then we asked, what are other things that we could do in order to make this work better? One of the things that we did discuss was defining good cause. Ultimately, um, reviewing the, the record of that committee hearing, as well as continued conversations with the stakeholders, defining good cause has not been identified as a good option because we can't agree on it. And nobody wants to take that discretion away from judges. Good cause is utilized throughout the Nevada revised statutes, um, and it is left to judges to understand and define. I will also say that personally, um, when we had this, we, the Senate, sorry, the Interim Judiciary Committee had this conversation about good cause, I thought maybe something we could do is utilize a definition from a previous Supreme Court case. So I reread uh, Bustos and Hill and all of the uh, cases about good cause continuances for preliminary hearings and found that the court has never actually defined good cause. They have determined... Uh, circumstances that are good cause and are not good cause, but nowhere is there a nice, succinct little phrase, good cause, which is, and then gives us a definition. So that's not a complaint. I'm not saying that they should, please, Supreme Court. That's not what I'm saying. What, what I'm suggesting is that um, it, was, it was a good idea. Let's define good cause, but it wasn't a workable solution. Um, and so we came up with, okay, what are the other problems that uh, that jurisdictions are having with not being able to continue their hearings. And we learned that some of them were uh, confused or that they wanted, they wanted more clarity that a judge could also define good cause, that it doesn't have to be the good cause of the plaintiff or the defendant. It could be the judge's good cause. And then the other thing that they asked for clarification on was whether the parties could stipulate to move the hearing. And so that's what Senate Bill 235 specifies, is that yes, the judge can be the person to develop the good cause, and yes, the parties can stipulate. And now I wanna go back to the other safety valves that we implemented and talked to jurisdictions about. Being able to do the hearings elect, you know, via video, being able to develop a rotating schedule. Um, and, and if, there were a policy proposal to make those um, options more viable if, if we knew what the problem was. I don't think that anybody on this committee would, would not be willing to roll their sleeves up and solve them. So um, I think that that is important to realize when, when considering the, the policy options on the table. And that's why I think SB 235 um, is a helpful piece of the puzzle to make these 48 hour hearings doable. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chair. We will go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 235 and I will turn the gavel back over to you. Thank you. Thank you for running such a nice meeting. Um, and that leaves me just with the public comment portion of today's meeting. If anybody would like to give public comment in Carson City or Las Vegas, please come to the table. Um, not seeing anybody, so we'll go to the phone for public comment. If you would like to provide public comment, please press, pre, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. BPS, is there someone on the phone line? No, there is not. There are no callers at this time. Oh, okay. 
I, I think that's long enough for people to call in. Um, so I will declare this meeting adjourned, and we'll see you again on Monday at 1 p.m.